This is a revision PowerPoint video for the Muslim practices topic of AQA. So we're beginning with the focusing on the five pillars and also the 10 obligatory acts that are within Shia Islam. So as a recap, and what we will go into a lot more detail on in a moment, are that the five pillars, first of all, are the Shahada, which is the Declaration of Faith, Salah, which is prayer, Zakah, which is charitable giving, Saum, which is fasting, and Hajj, which is the pilgrimage. So the ten obligatory acts within Shia Islam, four of them are those five pillars, with the exception of the Shahada. So it, so it doesn't include the Shahada, but it also includes a further six acts. So along with the pillars Salah, Zakah, Saum and Hajj, the ten obligatory acts include Qums, which is the 20% tax on excess income. And this is something that we'll look at in more detail. Half of that goes to charity and half to the religious leaders. Another is jihad. Again, it's something we, we look at within the war topic, uh, but also we'll explore it here. So there's two sides to it. Firstly, the struggle to maintain and defend Islam and the struggle to live by faith. For example, the struggle or difficulties in following the five pillars. The next two, these are separate, but I've put them together. Um, they sort of work in an opposite way. So Amr Bill Maruf is encouraging people to do what is good. And Nahi Anil Munkar is discouraging people from doing what is wrong. So on the one hand, encouraging good and on the other hand, discouraging wrong. So they work quite well together. The next is Tawala, which is to be loving towards the friends of God, including Muhammad and the Imams. And the last is Tabara, which is dissociating from the enemies of God. So you've got Salah, Zakah, Saum and Hajj, Qums, Jihad, Amr Bil Maruf, Nahi Anil Munka, Tawala and Tabara. So a huge part of this topic is to focus on the five pillars. And you could get a range of questions asking about the influence of them, maybe a 12 marker suggesting one is more important than the others which will be a great one to plan for because you just sort of reverse the arguments in that. So the first pillar is the Shahada, which is the declaration of faith. And in order to become a Muslim, someone needs to sincerely recite this statement in an official capacity. And they say there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. This must be done in front of a Muslim witness. And that's the only requirement to become a Muslim. It's said during prayers and at times such as the birth of a baby. And as well as being the first of the five pillars, it's actually the foundation of the other four. Because without this one, without faith, the other pillars would be seen as meaningless. You have to have faith as the foundation. So in a 12 mark answer, for example, it would be a very strong argument to suggest that the Shahada is the most important of the pillars. In Shia Islam, there is an extra sentence added on, which is, and Ali is the friend of God. So the next pillar is Salah. So the second pillar is Salah. And this is a set daily prayer, which is performed under conditions set out by the Prophet Muhammad. The times of prayer depend on the time of sunrise. So if you have a look at um, the prayer calendar, you'll see on different days, depending on the time of the year, prayer times might change maybe a minute uh, from one day to another. Sunni Muslims will pray five times a day. In Shia Islam, the prayers are combined. So the midday and afternoon prayers are combined. So it's three times a day. 
So a few points on this. So the Adan is the call to prayer. And prayer is called by the Muaddin, the caller uh, to prayer. Once the call to prayer has, has been heard, men generally will make their way to the mosque and some women too, but they will pray separately. And there's a question in your booklet on, on this, which goes alongside the PowerPoint. So women are often encouraged to pray at home. And that's because if they have children, they're encouraged to pray at home for practical reasons. Now, again, you could there's lots of questions you could get on the different pillars. Maybe why is prayer important? You know, this idea of it, it gives you that reminder. If you pray throughout the day, it gives you that reminder, um, sort of constant reminder of Allah. It's also worth noting you've got the prayer times at the, the top of the PowerPoint. So far just before sunrise, Zur just after midday, Asr in the afternoon, Maghrib just after sunset and Isha at night time. So in terms of prepara preparation for prayer, wudu is ritual washing or ablution. And the Quran gives details of how to perform wudu. You might remember the Holy Cribs clip that we've seen before. And if you just watch the snippet from 1 minutes 20 to 2.25 uh, from that link, you'll be able to see uh, the wudu being performed. In a mosque, men and women have separate rooms for washing. And if water isn't available, for example, if you're in the desert, you could use dust or sand. And I think that really highlights that it's not necessarily about being physically cleaned. It's, it symbolises being spiritually prepared for prayer. And so that idea of it doesn't have to be water would highlight that. And so preparation also helps you to focus on God before you pray. Another way that people will prepare for prayer, men may cover their head with a tuppy, women with a hijab or a scarf. And the focus of that is that Allah only looks at the heart. So some further details on prayer. It's always performed in the direction of Mecca. And that's because all Muslims are focused spiritually and mentally on the one place associated with God. So within a mosque, the mirab is in the direction of Mecca. So people know which direction to face. Also, many prayer mats that are used have an inbuilt compass in them so that you can find the right direction of Mecca wherever you are. So inside a mosque, prayer is led by an imam and men and women pray separately. If you pray at home, wudu must be performed first and a prayer mat is used as prayer must be on a clean surface. So this next point here on Jummah prayer. So this is quite an important area, the Friday midday prayer. It's congregational at the mosque. All males are expected to attend. And officially, it's seen that missing four Fridays could make somebody an unbeliever. And what's important about this, after prayer, the Imam will deliver a sermon about duties to God. So in your booklet, it explains the Katib gives the chukbah, the sermon, within two parts. And the Friday midday prayer is the only day when a sermon is said. He may speak about local and world issues and will give guidance on Islamic teachings. And the second sermon is a set speech in Arabic. This is quite important to think about Friday prayer and why that may be important. Like with a lot of... Uh, the, the five pillars that we look at, there are, I'll put links to the, the Dean Squad videos that, that are quite useful for talking about these, these issues. 
So you've got in your booklet a few questions. So why would somebody pray? So the Sora says prostrate and draw near to Allah. Also, you are closest to Allah when you pray. Prayer brings knowledge and helps you to become faithful. And also Muslims who pray will benefit on Judgment Day. So lots of arguments that could very easily be a two mark or a four mark question. So why would you pray five times a day or three times a day? So prayer is spread out throughout the day to keep your mind focused on Allah. It also gives you support. If you didn't pray throughout the day, your sins may build up. And finally, what benefits would a Muslim get from prayer? So prayer with others in the mosque is a reminder of the greatness of Allah. It's a reminder that everything comes from Allah. Preparation for prayer is a reminder of purity and determination. And it's also a reminder of equality. Everybody prays at the same time, facing the same direction together. So as we've already looked at the Jummah prayer. OK, so a little bit of detail on that. So again, you could get a question on this. Just asking maybe, maybe about its importance. So here's your links to the Dean Squad uh, videos um, that may be quite useful. So if we briefly look at the rakas, and these, again, I know we're spending a long time on prayer, but there's a few elements to it. So these are set actions that are performed during prayer. And although they're different for different prayer times, they include the following, and you've got a list. So firstly, while standing, you will recite the first chapter from the Quran. You will bow and say, glory be to my Lord, who is the very greatest, three times in Arabic. And bowing will show that God is great. You will then stand upright and make a recitation, praising God. Then prostration is to kneel with your forehead, nose, hands, knees and toes on the floor. And that, that idea of prostrating on the floor shows your obedience to God, your bowing before God. You will then sit and recite, God is the greatest. Prostrate and say it again. Then kneeling and turning to the left and right, saying, peace be upon you and the mercy and blessings of God. Now prayer, this will end with personal prayer, which can be said personally. So the doer prayer, these are just personal prayers that somebody will say. There is a good link, I think one of these videos, and I'll also put separate links on that you can click on to a, a very short video showing uh, somebody going through the rackers, which is quite useful. Okay, so that's the first two pillars. Okay, so the Shahada and prayer. We're now moving on to the third pillar of Zakah. And this is giving two and a half percent of your savings to the poor. Now, the point of this, the two and a half percent of excess wealth, it's compulsory for those who have enough. So if you don't have enough money, you're not expected to give. The threshold for this is called the Nisab, and it's based on the cost of gold. You don't need to go into detail on that. That money can be donated to charity like Muslim Aid. Or it could be given in a box within the mosque, which is then given to the poor and it's given to charity. Zaka is instructed within the Quran, which also teaches that alms or charitable giving are meant only for the poor, the needy. Many people will will give this at the end of Ramadan. So it can easily be worked out. There is um, a Zaka calculator where, where you can work out how much money you would need to give. But the good thing about this is, obviously, if somebody has a lot of money, two and a half percent of their money will be a lot higher than somebody with not very much. But again, it's not a massive amount for, for what they have. If they want to give uh, extra, we'll look at we'll look at that, the, the idea of sadaqa, which is extra voluntary giving. So if you um, if you support someone who's raising for charity, that's sadaqa. So voluntary giving. As we mentioned before, in Shia Islam, 
So one of the 10 obligatory acts comes is a 20% tax that's paid on excess income. So again, not on your basic income, on everything you have, it's on your excess wealth, what you have left over. Half of that is spent by religious leaders on things considered necessary and half goes to charity. So some questions you could receive on this could be what are the benefits or reasons for giving Zaka? And what is the significance of it? So the benefits, it could help you to acknowledge that everything comes from God. And within the human rights topic, we look at the idea of wealth and the idea that it belongs to Allah. So it's where you recognise that it comes from God. It may belong to him. It teaches self-discipline and honesty. It helps to purify your soul and remove selfishness. And it also improves the lives of others by giving money to others. You're improving their lives. And the significance, you fulfil a duty imposed by God. It's expected of you. So it's one of the five pillars. It gives you a good attitude towards money so that you're not greedy. Again, when we look at the human rights topic, there's quite a few quotes that we can look at on Islam and, and the use of wealth. And it also strengthens communities by supporting the poor within the community. So onto the fourth pillar of SORM or fasting. So SORM is fasting during daylight hours during the ninth month on the Islamic calendar, the month of Ramadan. It's obligatory to fast. However, there are exceptions such as pregnant and nursing mothers, those who are ill, children, although there may be a possibility that they could fast for a shorter amount of time. So during the month, Muslims will get up before sunrise to eat and then will share an evening meal with family and friends, followed by prayer. So during daylight hours, people do not eat, drink, smoke or have sex. It's not just about fasting, though. Rather than focusing on what you can't do, a focus is about charity and pleasing God. The benefits of feeling hungry is a reminder of how the poor feel. It will help a Muslim to feel inspired to help the poor. So understanding that that feeling of hunger, it reminds people that of those who don't know where their next meal is coming from. And so, as we mentioned before, zakah is often given during Ramadan. And the poor may be invited to eat the meal that breaks fast at sunset as well. Again, there's a, a link to a Dean Squad uh, video on this. And there's also a really good documentary called A Very British Ramadan, a 30 minute documentary that you might remember, um, which is really good just for exploring uh, people's experiences of Ramadan. So a question on this, explain the benefits observing Ramadan has on a Muslim. So a couple of points you could make on this four marker could be that fasting gives greater awareness of the poor and of those in need. It also encourages compassion and charity. A few other points you could use is that it helps you to focus on God and teaches you self-control. It also helps you to submit to God. Just be aware it may ask you for two benefits, so just put two of those and add depth to them. So the night of power is remembered during Ramadan. This was the start of the revelation of the Quran to Muhammad through the angel Jibril. On dates throughout the month, Muslims will try to keep awake to pray and study the Quran. And it gives the benefit of worshipping for a thousand months. So a quote to support, the night of glory is better than a thousand months. So on to the fifth pillar of Hajj. So this is a pilgrimage or a journey made for religious reasons. 
So it starts and ends in Mecca in the last month of the Islamic calendar. And the pilgrimage should be made at least once in a lifetime, if possible. But obviously for financial or health reasons, it may not be. Communities may support those who can't afford to go, though. And a quote to support this, pilgrimage to the house is a duty owed to God by people who are able to undertake it. So we looked before in the previous topic at the Prophet Ibrahim. And so Hajj remembers the Prophet Ibrahim. So it's based on the 4,000 year old story of the Prophet being told by God to take his wife and son to Arabia. He was then told uh, to, to leave them on their own with food and water supplies. Once those supplies ran out, his wife prayed and her son struck his foot on the ground which caused water to gush up. When Ibrahim returned, he was told by God to dedicate a shrine to God, and that was the Kaaba. Centuries later, Mecca was established nearby, using water from his son Ishmael's well, called the Zamzam well. Over the years, idols were worshipped in Mecca. But later, when Muhammad and a group of, of others journeyed from Medina to Mecca, that was seen as the first pilgrimage. And since then, only God is worshipped there. You wouldn't need to explain this story, but it's quite important to know the background of that's the what's focused on uh, as an element of that is focused on with Hajj. And so this story and this story of Abraham, Ibrahim being willing to sacrifice his son for God. These are remembered during Hajj and we'll see the actions that people take during Hajj and how they reflect this story. So again, you've got a link to a video clip. So in your booklet, you've got a table that just explains these different things. I know it's quite detailed. You can keep it quite simple. But just be aware that you might need to discuss how Hajj is performed. So the first thing you'll do is to enter a state of Iram. And this is where you'll perform ritual washing, so wudu and praying. Men will wear white robes to show equality. And women will also cover up in one colour. Then you will circle the Kaaba in an anti-clockwise direction touching the black stone or raising your hand to acknowledge it. And there's just a bit of detail on there what it represents. So it's the idea that it was built by Adam, rebuilt by Noah after the flood. And it shows the direction of prayer. Next, you will travel to Arafat and that involves walking un under the walkway between the hills of Safa and Marwa. After seven circuits, you'll return to the Kaaba and collect water from the Zamzam well. Pilgrims will then stay at Mina for the night and continue to travel to Arafat the following day. And just a bit about what, why that is done. Those hills are the ones that Hajar ran up and down when searching for water. And it's reenacted to represent difficulties people may face in life. And the Zamzam is the well that Ishmael discovered when he and Hajar were suffering. It has life-giving qualities as a cure. So people will drink water from that well. Now completing these stages is Umrah, which is the lesser pilgrimage. So you may finish it there. But the next stages of the pilgrimage involve standing at Arafat. So spending the afternoon standing and praying in the sun. By doing this, God will forgive the sins of those who stand. And as a reminder of, of the meaning of this, this is where Muhammad perform, performed his last sermon. It's also where Adam and Hawa were reunited after being sent from paradise. The next stage is to throw pebbles at Mina. So they will walk to Musdalifa and collect 49 pebbles. These are then thrown at three walls, the Jamarat, and that represents throw, Satan. So throwing those pebbles at Satan. And these represent the three places that Satan tried to persuade Ibrahim not to sacrifice his son. Muslims will reflect on their own lives. 
Then the, the next day, the pilgrims will circle the Kaaba seven times. Two more nights are spent at Mina for prayer and reflection. So I know there's a lot of detail there, but if you can fill in your booklet with just key key ideas of what happens and maybe then look at the what it represents too. So if we look at the significance of Hajj, which is within the uh, AQA textbook page 45, in the booklet I've put the, the term shift just to help you as a bit of an, um, a way of remembering the first letter of, of each word to remember. So these could be five points on the significance of Hajj. You could well get a question that would ask you to give two reasons why it's important, but, but these are quite useful. So first of all, it shows self-discipline. The physical and mental demands of Hajj are great. It also teaches sincerity and humility in a relationship with God. It's a reminder of the examples of Ibrahim in particular. It can lead to forgiveness for sin. And it can also bring about a deep spiritual transformation to make the Hajji, somebody who's completed Hajj, a better person. So there's a lot of information on Hajj. And we'll come back to it uh, when we think about festivals in a little bit. So if we think about jihad, jihad means a struggle against evil. And there are two types of jihad. Within the war topic, we focus on lesser jihad. But the term greater jihad, it means an inward struggle to live in line with faith. A Muslim will try to establish virtues and would follow the five pillars of Islam. So it's about developing spirituality. So by giving money to the poor, volunteering for charity or learning the Quran by heart, somebody develops spiritually. Lesser jihad is seen as being less important. And in the early days, when Islam was under threat, violence was used when it was needed. And so when we look at the war topic, we talk about lesser jihad. In your booklet, there's a reminder of the term cars to represent some of the features of that. And it's worth noting the term jihad is not used to justify terrorism. And we often hear the term jihad misused within the news. But it's important that it can never be used as part of that. It's about defending faith. And actually, the focus really for many is greater jihad as being the, the, the main concept. So, yeah, just a reminder of the idea. So fighting for religious cause is called a holy war. And lesser jihad obliges a Muslim to fight under certain conditions. And there are very strict rules about these conditions. So that just recaps the, the war topic, but you've just got the, the term cars to, to sort of help you there. So a few reasons why lesser jihad can't be used to justify terrorism. It's seen as a struggle to defend Islam from threats. And as we saw, that was important in the early days where Muslims were persecuted. However, lesser jihad cannot justify terrorism that targets innocent civilians. If you look at the code of conduct, the, the term cars, the criteria for a holy war or lesser jihad, you'll see that it could never justify that. So we're near the end of this topic where we are focusing on three festivals. Two of them are Eid al Fita and Eid al Adha. And it's important not to get them confused, especially if you were to get a 12 mark question on one of them. A good way of remembering Eid al Fita, think of the word feast within Fita, Eid al Feaster. And this is just a way of just remembering that it's about food at the end of the celebration. So the definition is a festival that represents the end of Ramadan. As we looked at with the idea of fasting, that's in the month of Ramadan. So 
Eid al Fitr marks the end of Ramadan. It's also called Lesser Eid. During this time, Muslims will thank God for his guidance and wisdom, and also for the strength he's given them throughout that month. So this festival marks the end of Ramadan. So it's important if you're asked about it, you can talk about Ramadan. And this festival focuses on, on the end of that and maybe lessons learnt from it. So the importance of it is that Allah must be the focus of everything. That time should not be wasted on material things. The Quran and prayer should be dominant. Behaviour should be modest, polite, peaceful, kind and generous. And wealth should be used to benefit the community. And that's a key idea. Obviously, for, for many, zakah is given as part of this. So how it's celebrated. Again, you might get a question of what it represents, but you could also be asked how it's celebrated. So it's celebrated for between one and three days. Muslims will gather and say special prayers. The Imam sermon will remind a message of forgiveness and helping the poor. People will wear their best clothes, decorate their hands and homes and eat special foods. Many will also give cards and presents. A very separate festival then, Eid al-Adha. This represents Ibrahim. And again, a way of remembering it, Adha, test from God. So where Ibrahim, Adha, test from God. It's a bit of a silly way, but it's, it might be helpful to remember the difference if you're asked a question on, on one of these. This is no, also known as Greater Eid or the Festival of Sacrifice. It lasts for four days and is part of Hajj. It remembers Ibrahim, who was willing to sacrifice his son under God's instruction. But God was testing him by asking him to do that. So instead they sacrificed a ram. So God asked him to sacrifice his son. He was willing, but at the last moment, he provided a ram for them to sacrifice. So how it's celebrated, people will visit family and friends and enjoy festive meals together. They will pray at the mosque. Animals are slaughtered to remember the story of Ibrahim. But this may be quite different for many people. They may not actually slaughter an animal. Generally, what's, what it's seen as if an animal slaughtered, the family keep a third of the meat. They'll give a third to family and friends and a third for the poor. Many people now, rather than doing that, they'll give money instead of meat. And people will make effort to include everyone and celebrate together. So the final part of this topic is the festival of Ashura. So three festivals that you need to know about. Eid al-Fita, and think about what that represents, Eid al-Adha, and Ashura. So Ashura means 10th, and it's a day of remembrance for Shia Muslims on the 10th month. It's also known as the Day of Atonement. It may also remember when Israelites were freed from slavery in Egypt. Or some may focus on the day that Noah left the ark. Now, a key thing to focus on with Ashura, it was nominated as a day of fasting by Muhammad. And it's seen, particularly for Shia Muslims, it's a great day of sorrow because of the events of the Battle of Kabbalah, in which Hussein, the grandson of Muhammad, along with 70 other men, died. And it's remembered with much sorrow. And Hussein's martyrdom represents a struggle against injustice, tyranny and oppression. So although there are other things remembered, the focus, particularly in Shia Islam, is on the death of Hussein. So the way it's commemorated, in many Muslim countries, it's a public holiday. And what you may see during the day are where Shia Muslims will take part in public expressions of grieving. There may be plays performed that tell the story of Hussein, marches, speeches, and for some they might gather together and beat their chests in unison to mourn.
In Sunni Islam, many will voluntarily fast. They may give to charity or show kindness to their families and to the poor. So it's not seen as important within Sunni Islam as it is with Shia. And it's not as solemn a day. Now, what many people will do instead of this idea of remembering the death of Hussein and bloodshed. Many people, rather than beating themselves in public or um, to remember his bloodshed, UK religious leaders will encourage many people to donate blood to the blood transfusion service instead in order to, to remember. So that brings us to the end of the Islam practices topic. So hopefully you've got access to the booklet alongside this. Use the textbook as well and have a go at lots of practice questions around this.